Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from one of our special guests. All right. Got your Bibles? I'm reading from the book of Leviticus. That is in the Bible. Chapter 16 and verse 10. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement upon it and to let it go as the scapegoat into the wilderness. A few years ago, I went and saw a movie. It's about two old guys traveling around the world who were doing all the things at the end of their life that they'd always wanted to do, and they called it their bucket list. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Now we have that term bucket list in our English language, and you'll often hear people say, oh, that's in my bucket list. I want you to think this morning, just for the message this morning, that you've got a bucket list. And in that bucket list, you have, just for this morning, all your old sins, issues, hurts, regrets, embarrassments, condemnations, guilt, whatever it may be. In all religious situations, they would literally cut off part of the flesh of people's bodies to satisfy religious beliefs to deal with those issues. Thank God we don't do that today. But we do have equally ineffective ways today. I've been going to some churches for 30 years. And you know what? I still see the same people on the altars dealing with the same issues that they got saved from 30 years ago. What was put under the blood and nailed to the cross when you got saved is still there today. Come on, hallelujah, it hasn't changed. The Old Testament has the answer for your bucket list, fulfilled in the New Testament, fulfilled in Jesus, fulfilled in you and I. I want to talk to you about a day in the Jewish calendar called Yom Kippur. God set up this day in the Old Testament, one day a year, to allow the people of Israel to get rid of what we're calling their bucket list for the previous year. No matter what they'd done in the previous year, they were not allowed to carry the weight of it for more than one year. If you did, you'd be overwhelmed and it would be more than you were able to cope with. So God set aside this day and he said it's the holiest day of the year. It was not about worship. It was a mechanism that God put into place for you to bring your guilt, your hurts, your sin, your shame and all of the things in the bucket list and then they would be sent to a faraway place never to return. Yom Kippur is also called the Day of Atonement. It centers around two goats. Goats in Scripture are usually uh, something to do with sin. They would cast lots over the two goats. One goat would be for God inside the temple, The other goat would be called the scapegoat outside the temple. And the word scapegoat in the Hebrew language is the word azazel. Everybody say that, please. It means take him away. And it comes from the root Hebrew word, meaning weapon in the hand of the enemy. 
So what it meant was anything that you had in the previous year and anything the enemy could ever try to use against you was being sent away never to return. Come on, hallelujah. The time of Yom Kippur from the new year was 10 days. During those 10 days, the Israelites were to think of all the stuff that they'd put in their bucket list and bring to the temple. The goat inside the temple, the priest would lay hands on it, shout out several things so the people outside could hear. Before we go any further, we need to understand the levels of sin in Israel's culture. Number one, iniquity. That is the initial starting point to any sin. The Hebrew word for iniquity literally means whatever your eye hooks onto multiplies. Wow. Let me say that again. Whatever your eye hooks onto, multiplies. The second level is the word sin as we know it. You look, you lust, you decide you want it, you go after it, you do it, now you are sinning. And the third word or level is transgression. The breaking or transgressing of the law. In Isaiah 53 verse 6, the great prophetic chapter of Jesus going to the cross and taking our sin and sickness upon himself. It says this, The Lord has laid on him, Jesus, the iniquity of us all. Wow. God forgives not just what we have done, but all the way back to whatever our eye ever hooked onto. Thank God. That's called the grace of God. Yom Kippur has three elements to it. The temple, the priest, and the goats, and the day centered, as we said earlier, primarily around the two goats. One goat for God in the temple, they take it, they sacrifice it. Outside the temple would be approximately 350,000 Israelites who would show up with what we call their bucket list for that day. The second goat was called the scapegoat. A visual presentation outside the temple of what was going on inside the temple. The first thing inside the temple, they'd take the goat to the altar, lay hands on it. And the high priest of that day had the authority to impart all the sins or the bucket list of Israel onto the head of that goat. The word impart is the Hebrew word mala. Everyone say mala. It's imparting. I imparted it. In Revelation 13, verse 8, it says, The Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. God the Father has imparted all the sins of mankind, you and I, onto Jesus, that we might be free. In the ninth hour, the priest would pull the goat's head back and cry out these remarkable words. It is finished. Oh, I love that. In John 19, verse 30, Jesus on the cross cries out the words, It is finished. They thought he was talking about his life, but he wasn't. He was saying, the time of the devil is finished. The time of sin is finished. The time of sickness is finished. Come on, hallelujah. Every person that's born again, sin is finished. 
But it was more than that. There was a veil between the most holy of holies and the rest of the temple. And a high priest could only go in there once a year to make atonement for the sin of the people. But when Jesus cried out, it is finished, the veil was rent from top to bottom, meaning it opened up the way so that any man, woman, boy, girl, young person that's born again can now go into the presence of God and now be accepted by God and have fellowship with God. Whoa! Wonderful. The second goat, the scapegoat, Azazel, take him away. They'd lay hands on the head of that goat outside the temple. Confess over it the bucket list of those 350,000 Israelites for the past year. And then they would appoint a man whose task it was to take the goat into the wilderness through the crowd and release it for it never, ever to return. They would also take a red cord, wrap it around the goat's head, cut part of the red cord off, and put it on the door of the temple. And as the man marched the goat through the crowd, he would shout out these words, Behold Israel, your sin is being removed as far as the east is from the west. He would have to shout it many times so the people could hear it. The Bible says things by what it doesn't say. Watch this. In Psalm 113, verse 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our sins. Notice he didn't say north and south because north and south meet. That means if it was north and south, it would all come back. But he said east and west East and west never meet. It goes into infinity. It means it never comes back. That's how far God has removed our sin. It's gone and it never comes back. Come on, hallelujah. The people, the crowd would watch the goat. Their bucket list went with the goat. The red cord hanging on the door of the temple would supernaturally turn white. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18 says, Come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. White in the Bible talks about purity, spotlessness, holiness. And once we have given our life to Jesus, once our sin is under the blood of Jesus, nailed to the cross, we have then become pure, spotless, and holy. And we can come into the presence of God and be totally and absolutely accepted <laughs> by God. This was a picture, type, of your and my sins, hurts, issues, regrets, embarrassments, 
all been taken away, being removed, so that anything the enemy might try to use against us has now gone. Come on, hallelujah. The bucket list is now empty. That is the miracle of Yom Kippur. One more thing happened at that end. It was this. Officially, with one motion, the priest would sit on a special seat on the stage in the temple. And the moment he sat down, it was an indication to the 350,000 Israelites the work had been done. There was nothing else left to do. Your bucket list is now empty. The cord had turned white. And the goat had left their house. Imagine, if you will, the relief in the hearts of the Israelites. They say that it was a, the most tremendous celebration ever each year. They would shout, they would sing, they would whistle, they would jump. And it would go on hour after hour after hour. Amazing celebration. We come to church and we go, we are exhorted to praise the Lord and lift our hands like the Bible says, and we go, hallelujah. And then somebody will shout out, praise the Lord, and we all look at them like there's something wrong with them when in fact there's something right with them. Come on, are you hearing me? Come on, hallelujah. Now that we are saved, we ought to rejoice like never before. You watch the Super Bowl. They shout, they cheer. But that's not the rejoicing of the saints. The saints ought to be greater than all of that. <laughs> Hallelujah. Lady said to me one time, you don't have to shout, God is not deaf. And he's not nervous either. And shouting in the word of God means victory. You've been triumphant. You've overcome. You've conquered. Come on, hallelujah. In the New Testament, Jesus is our atoning sacrifice. He was our scapegoat. Azazel, take him away. Remember in John 19, Pilate took Jesus before the people and he said, what do you want me to do with him? And on one occasion they said, take him away. I think there's more there than we have ever realized. Jesus, the scapegoat, has carried our sins away. Never to return. In Hebrews 10, verses 11 and 12, it talks about, as a lot of Hebrews does, about once Jesus was resurrected, he sat on the right hand of God the Father. That means the work was done. But something else happened when you and I got saved. The Bible says we are now seated in heavenly places, in Christ Jesus, 
far above principalities and powers and the rulers of darkness in high places. Hallelujah. We are above everything, not beneath everything. We've been saved, born again, washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's no more work to be done. You don't have to do anything more because he did it all. People come to me. They say this. Pastor Al, I'm saved and I can't wait to go to heaven. I go, good. What about you? Are you excited about going to heaven? I go, yeah. You don't sound excited. Well, I am going. (laughs) Yeah, I am going. But not just yet. I'm happy down here. Come on, are you hearing me? I'll get there. And I'll be there a long time. (laughs) See, that's all Christianity is to some people. I got saved and I'm going to heaven, that's it. I want to tell you something. In the midst of the most diabolical circumstances in your life, you can have heaven down here on earth. Come on, come on, come on. When I was in hospital, they operated on me, as you know, for cancer. By the way, they tell me I'm cancer free. Yeah, a few years ago. God spoke to me, probably because it was the only place he could get me quiet enough to talk. (laughs) You have to understand me. And God said this to me, are you ready to die? That's not a nice question to hear from God. I went, yes, I am. But if you think you're going to take me home, you got a fight on your hands. I'm happy to stay here. I got a lot more to do. I got to win a lot more people to Jesus. I got to see more people get healed. I got to see God show up in more churches and see the world get changed. Plus, I've read your Bible several times. And I don't read where you say there's golf in heaven. (laughs) I want to give you a little time. (laughs) Anybody with me on that? (laughs) Or Or whatever. But are you getting the point? Your sins are forgiven if you're saved. The bucket list is empty. You are cleansed. The work is finished. The cord has turned white. And we're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Say, wait a minute, I'm human. What if I commit sin, not deliberately, 
but I commit sin unwittingly. Ah, Jesus took care of that. In John 1 verse 7, where it talks all about confessing your sins and he's faithful and just to forgive your sins. It says the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all. Everybody shout all. all. Oh, come on, shout it, please. All. Cleanses us from all unrighteousness. The term blood of Jesus cleanses from all unrighteousness is in the present continuous tense in the original Greek language. It means he cleanses and keeps on cleansing. So at no time are we separated from God. Come on, we can always come into the presence of God and be accepted. To balance the message, if you go out and deliberately, willfully, knowledgeably, knowingly commit sin, then I believe you need to repent and the blood will cleanse you. Can you say amen to that? Amen. When the devil comes to you, as he does, as Pastor Jim said in the first service, and plays, what was the word he used with your head? No. Racquetball with your head. I'd say ping pong. You go, stop! Don't listen to him. And you go, the goat has left my house. When you're trying to win some friend to Jesus or get them to come to church and they go to you, ha, 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 I'm not coming because I remember when you used to go, stop. The goat has left my house. When you're talking to your mum or dad or your in-laws or outlaws, and they say, oh, ha, 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 I remember when you used to do, go, uh, stop, stop, stop. The goat has left my house. You say, well, they don't know what I'm talking about. I know that you know. Come on, hallelujah, you know. The goat has left your house. I'm walking through the Bris uh, Sydney airport, domestic terminal, busy, busy. People running, people walking, cafes everywhere, the noise, just amazing. And all of a sudden I heard something that just stopped the whole crowd, it was this. The goat has left my house. Everything stopped cold. I'm looking around, and I saw a guy sort of off to my right, and he's going like this to me. <laughs> Thumbs up. So I shouted back, and he's left my house too. Come on, hallelujah. A man walks up to me a few weeks ago. I'd say he was in his early 50s after a morning meeting. He had tears running down his face. And he said to me, Pastor Al, can I talk to you? And I said, yeah. He said, I got saved 12 years ago, and I got saved. I'd been a raging alcoholic for many years. I've never touched alcohol since. I love God. But he said, for 12 years, I have lived with the regrets, the hurts, 
the wounds of my past life as an alcoholic. And I wished I'd heard this message back then because today I discovered the goat has left my house. Come on, hallelujah. Come on, are you hearing me? And I'm here this morning to tell you that if you're saved, the goat has left your house. Let's stand together, please. Don't leave. We're not finished. Just seems like it. I want you to shout, if you will, three times out loud. The goat has left my house right deep down. Are you ready? Ladies, you shout at one time, please. The goat has left my house. I did that in the early service, and a couple guys shouted it out. <laughs> all right, all the men, would you shout it right now, please? The goat has left my house. Yeah. Would you turn around and look at somebody and say to them, look them right in the eye, the goat has left my house. All right, look at me. One more time before pastor comes, would you shout it out loud, please? The goat has left my house. Yeah. Ask everyone to bow your head and close your eyes, please. This morning, we're going to pray for the greatest miracle that can happen to a human being. That is the miracle of Jesus Christ coming into your heart, into your life, and washing all of your sin away. So what are you talking about? Every person in this world has been born into this world with an inherent nature of sin because of the fall of Adam and Eve. You, me, and everyone else. But God said, I'll make a way out for you. His son Jesus went to the cross. And on the cross, he took the sin of all mankind upon him. And he says... If you will make a choice, a decision to invite me into your heart and life, I'll come in spiritually. I'll wash all of your sin away. I'll become your Savior. And you'll become my son and daughter. At this point, people start making excuses for it not to happen. They say things like, I don't want to be religious. We don't want you to be religious either. Christianity is not a religion in spite of what people have done to it. It's about relationship. You say, well, what will my friends think about me? If you live your life based on what friends are going to think about you, you're in a sad situation. Say, so, well, I've got my church. We're not talking about your church. We're talking about Jesus coming into your life and washing your sin away. So, well, man, all my family, they've been going to church for years. I'm cool. No. Nobody can make this choice for you. You have to make it yourself. You say, well, I'll go home and think about it. That's just a very nice way of saying no. Say, so, well, I think 
Jesus is in my life. I think I'm a Christian. I hope I am. I'm doing the best I can. It's not about what you're doing. It's about who's in your life and what he's doing. And if you say, I think I'm a Christian, I hope I am, the reality is that you're not. For if you were, you would never say, I think so or I hope so. You would say, I know so. I know that I belong to God. I know that he belongs to me. I know that my bucket list is empty. I know that my sin is washed away. And like we did this morning and yesterday morning in service, We want to pray for men and women, whether you're visiting for the first time or you've been here one or two times before or maybe even become a regular attendant. Say, Al, I need Jesus. I need to know my sin is washed away. I need to know that I belong to God and God belongs to me. I need to know for sure. And I want you to pray for me for that to happen. And in order to pray for you, I'm going to ask you to respond by simply raising your hand, holding it up, letting me see it, and putting it down at this moment. Would you do that right now, please? Just put your hand up, let me see it, all over this building. Hey, I need Jesus. I need him to come into my life. There's a hand over here. There's one, two, three, four, five over there. There's over here, God bless you. Down here, there's two. God bless you. Way up in the balcony, there's people. God bless you. Others over here in the back, God bless you. Others of you may put your hands down. If you haven't raised your hand, would you raise it right now? Just put it up. Let me see it. If you haven't already done it, just do it right now. Way up in the back row, God bless you. Anybody else, just put your hand up. Let me see it. Over here, God bless you. Way down in the, up, up in the windowed area, God bless you. Up another one in the window area, God bless you. Yes, down here, God bless you. Up there, God bless you. You may put your hands down. For the last time, if there's anybody else, if you have not raised your hand, would you just put it up right now so we can pray for you, for Jesus to come into your life. Down the front here, over there on the aisle, God bless you. Anyone else upstairs? All right, let's stand together, please. I want you to look at me and listen to me, please. People have raised their hands in the windowed areas up there, down the front, in the middle, up in the balcony areas, side to side. We want to pray for you. And in order to pray for you, and I want you to listen to me before you respond, we're going to ask you in a moment to step out of your seat push past the people in the rows, walk down the various aisles, stand in the front facing me so we can pray for you. You say, do I need to come? If it was worth raising your hand, it's worth coming down here. The Bible is very clear. If we confess Jesus publicly, he'll confess us before his heavenly Father. We're not against you, we're for you. Most of us have made this choice somewhere, sometime. If you need somebody to come with you, grab a hold of somebody and say, come with me. If you brought somebody this morning, kindly and politely invite them to come and receive Jesus and come with them. Every person that raised your hand and others, Would you kindly step out of your seats right now, walk down the aisle and stand in front of me so we can pray for you. Would you do that right now? They're beginning to come. They're beginning to come. Over here. Back here. Up in the back. Over here. Come on. Come on. Here they come. They're coming from all over. That's it. I see you down the back. Keep coming, keep coming, 
spread out in one line across the front Lord, here, please. Help me, ushers. Keep coming. God bless you. God bless you. I live for you. God bless you. Every breath that I take. God bless you. Come right to the front. God bless you. God bless this couple. Lord, have your way. God bless you. Yeah. Still coming. Still coming. I give you my soul. Come on over, guys. God bless you. Wow. Wow. God bless you. All right, let me have a look at them. Every altar call I do anywhere in the world, I look at every one of them in the eye. Some with thousands, I just look. Because you never know who's going to be the next history maker and world changer. Come on, hallelujah. If there's anybody else this morning, this is your opportunity. You can still step out of your seats. Come down and stand with these remarkable people. God love you. God love you. Anybody else, you can still come. God bless you. The goat is leaving their house. All right, we're going to pray. I'm going to pray a prayer out loud, a line at a time. And I'm going to ask all of you at the front to repeat it together, each line out loud after me like it was your own prayer. And the whole crowd is going to pray it super loud with you. Let's pray. Here we go. Dear Lord Jesus, I come to you this morning. And I thank you for this opportunity to receive you into my life. I confess to you now that I am a sinner and I need you. I ask you to wash all of my sin away. I thank you now, Lord Jesus, that you are hearing and answering my prayer. And I now belong to you, and you belong to me. You are now my Savior, and I am now your son or daughter. I thank you, Jesus. I praise you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Amen. Now, all of you at the front, we just want to help you a little bit with your next part of the journey in this decision for Christ. And we're going to ask you to follow this wonderful man. He's waving at you. You're just going to go over here for a few moments. Would you just turn? Don't go back to your seat. Follow him over there. Let's give him a hand as they go. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent Him for me and that He died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that His blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin 
and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.